Thanks for joining us on Rethink with Reed. I'm Reed Kilmer. Today's topic, we're going to cover something that I find extremely interesting, I'm very curious about, and I think many other people are as well, and that's concussions. As a parent, I'm constantly wondering what sports am I going to allow my children to play? Are contact sports even an option anymore? And as a sports fan, when that big hit happens on the football field, I rarely cheer when that happens and grimace most of the time when hoping that that player is going to be able to get back up and wondering what just happened to his brain. So I looked for some answers. I came across a clinical neuropsychologist who also happens to be the director of clinical research at the Center for Brain Behavior and Biology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Dr. Arthur Marylander. So I asked him, what's going on in our brain when a concussion happens? How much do we know? What are you seeing in the lab through your different kinds of research? Are there safe sports to play? And would he allow his grandchildren and children to play contact sports. So if you want to rethink this issue and learn a little bit more about concussions, I invite you to watch this interview, give us some feedback in the comments below, and enjoy. Thanks. So Art, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to meet with me. Do you want to just tell me a little bit about yourself, about your studies that you've done through your years and your work? Well, it's pretty varied. Um, I started in education, um, went into performance psychology, then into neuropsychology, and actually was doing research in learning disabilities, but because of my background as a um, Division I uh, rugby coach and uh, representative player, the concussion thing kind of captured me. and took me along with the wave, uh, so I started doing a lot more work. Um, I was always interested in assessing uh, athletes and, and people with traumatic brain injury, and so the concussion stuff really took off. I had been the uh, director of pediatric neuropsychological services at Dartmouth Medical Center for about 15 years, and got to a point where I was going to retire and Dennis Malfis, who was starting up CB3 here, um, talked me into coming here. And uh, so I went from doing 20% research and 80% clinical to 80% research and 20% uh, clinical. And we've been working on you know, brain imaging research, um, biofluid research, looking at uh, some of the um, compounds and proteins in saliva that might indicate concussion and when concussion is recovered. Um, we look at biomechanics. I work with a group in um, Virginia and North Carolina that um, is doing bio, some of the biomechanics research with accelerometers in the helmets. Um, been doing that for about 10 years now. And uh, then just clinical kinds of research, uh, assessing, um, studying tests, developing tests, um, so a wide array of uh, different kinds of things. So is it rewarding work? I mean, it seems like you'd be uh, the, the, the front end of research with these kinds of things as it becomes more and more of a concern. Well, to be honest, what's rewarding about it is that the whole concussion research enterprise really got started as a way to look at brain injury in general. It, it really wasn't about athletes per se. Uh, it was about having a, a controlled environment so that you could um, sort of predict that some people were going to get concussions and mild brain injuries and then you could study them. So we would do baseline assessments and then when they got injured, the gold standard is, well, if you have a baseline, then you know what to compare against. So it really got started as a, um, a function of understanding brain injury. It's It's turned into its own realm now with uh, all the, the focus on professional sports and collegiate sports and um, some of the litigation around brain injuries and things. But what's rewarding to me is understanding brain injury and being able to um, help kids particularly, but even adults who have even more severe uh, brain injuries. Um, you know, concussion actually is, is a mild injury. The, the So in and of itself, it's not that concerning because people get better. Uh, but there's a high risk of making it worse if you don't take care of it. And that's what we used to do, right? We used to say, oh, you're okay, you got ding, go back in. 
and that's where the, the problems are is is getting repeat hits and um, not letting yourself recover so um, kind of addressing that piece is, has been really important but it is a mild injury and people have to understand that kids and adults get mild brain injuries all the time they're not good we're not saying oh it's nothing but what's particularly problematic is not taking care of it and getting hurt again mm. so how much do we really know about the brain is it as it develops is it so much different like a, a 10 year old's brain compared to a 40 year old's brain how much do we really know about all these different kinds well that's and that's the problem with young kids is as the brain is developing we know a lot about uh, the development of the brain and if you interrupt that development with an injury it has far greater consequences than if you um, hurt a, a pretty well cooked, a pretty well developed brain, uh, because you're not only injuring it and slowing down the development, but you're altering the course of development. And so we can see some significant problems later on in life from mild injuries that weren't taken care of early on in, in life. Mm, okay. So as we have these kids going through elementary, middle, high school, athletic sports, and people are concerned, what would you tell them about what to look out for and what to watch out for when they're selecting a sport? Well, that's a good question. Um, parents ask me this a lot. Because we don't really know how many uh, concussions is bad, we do know that one is not bad. That one, if it's taken care of, is not a problem and probably two is not a problem but after that it's not only the number but the intervals between them um, start to become more of a concern so I I'm a big advocate of contact and, and collision sports we can make them safer we can improve the rules um, but if if my kid gets a concussion I'm gonna be concerned I'm not going to, but if he really wants to play or she really wants to play, I'm not going to say, no, you can't, you've had one concussion. But if they get a second, then we're going to have a different discussion. Mm -hmm. And so um, my advice is to pay attention and um, to not get hysterical about it if, if you get one. But when we start seeing two, three, four, and particularly when the intervals start getting shorter, um, we also notice that the symptoms become more severe the more they get then it's probably time to stop um, or take a break at the very least. So you're, so you're a fan of sports, you watch them, you let, would let your own son or grandchildren play, say, football. Being I, one of the hard I coached and played and I still am involved in uh, um, high-level rugby, yes. I'm, um, uh, the, the benefit of sports is way too important to, to just stop doing it. Now I will say, and to be honest with you, if our research showed that one or two concussions is really bad and you should never uh, get that many even at that low level and we have to stop i say it's fine let's stop let's not do it but the evidence is not there yet um, and i do think there's some coming evidence that, that we've collected that in younger kids under the age of 14 13 there's probably no need to start in let me put it this way if it's a cumulative thing why start when you're 10 11 or 12 mm. because by the time you're 14 if you've had two or three then in in my view you're sort of reaching your limit if you start at 14 go through high school and get one or two you're probably fine you know there's there's no there's no problem so i do think we uh, and more and more I, i've been waffling on this over the years but more and more i'm really um, on the side of we probably should stop contact uh, full contact um, before the age of between 12 and 14 I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the, the point should be but um, there's no there's no inherent need to, to play contact before that it doesn't improve your chances of getting in the NFL it doesn't uh, improve your skill level um, there are other skills to develop and so I, I would advocate as as many others are now, that we probably could stop and, and play flag or play touch. But I don't want to see football go away by any means. And I, um, I, I, at this point, again, the research starts to point clearly in that direction. I'll change my opinion, but 
you know, I'm, I'm pretty involved in the research and I haven't seen the evidence that says we need to do that yet. Okay. So as kind of the years go on and this stigma kind of has its place on concussions, especially football, we kind of hear about parents going away from football or mm -hmm. certain contact sports. Is there such a thing as a safe sport to play or is it just a risk that comes with anything? Well, it depends on what you mean by safe. Um, if you mean that you'll never get a head injury, I mean, there are more concussions from bicycling than any other activity. Um, life has inherent risks. Um, so walking down the street, you can, you can get a concussion. But certainly track and field, tennis, bowling, um, those sports have a much lower risk, swimming, um, and then you have higher risk sports, the contact collision sports. I mean, even basketball has a, a, a moderate level of risk. Um, and so that's the other thing I, I talk to parents about is the, the risk. And um, it's not automatic that if you play, you're going to get a concussion. But you do have a higher risk. And the more you get, the more that risk goes up for getting more. So um, it's, it's managing the risks that becomes important. And we can mitigate some of those risks with things that um, we do, the rules um, that, that we put into, into sports, uh, the techniques we teach. You know, we see higher incidence rates of concussion in kids who are just learning how to play the game because they don't know how to play, they don't know how to fall, they don't uh, know how to take the contact. And so good skill technique is, is really, really important. There's equipment that helps. It doesn't guarantee anything, but we can uh, do better things. Um, you know, teams are not uh, practicing, football teams aren't practicing contact during the week anymore. Uh, the NFL stopped that years ago. Um, um, and has that lowered the quality of the game? I haven't seen that, but um, <laughs> um, it, that, that reduces the risk. Mm -hmm. So. Um, there's, there's a lot of things we can do to, to minimize the risk. And so for me, that's, that's where you know, I'm putting a lot of my energy right now. Again, if the research comes out and says this is bad business, then I'll support that. Um, but don't see it yet. So, sure. so through uh, in just very simple terms, could you explain what is happening to the brain when a concussion happens? <laughs> Well, in very simple terms, uh, we don't know, and that's the problem. Um, that's a, a very big problem because we don't have um, what we call a biomarker, um, a physiologic response that says this is a, con a concussion. And the problem with that is that that makes identifying the concussion very difficult, and it makes knowing when there is no longer a concussion, when it's recovered, very difficult. So it that from a clinical point of view we tend to be safe and and careful and if we think it's a concussion we'll put them in the protocol take them out and a high percentage of the time we're not sure where that has the biggest impact is in research because when we do our research studies if we're taking these cases that are we're not sure and putting them in the concussion category then what we get is what we've been seeing is the studies are all over the map because we don't have very clear identification of concussion. But what we think happens, um, to, to get back to your question and answer it, is um, there's uh, a biomechanical force that jars the brain in such a way that a, um, a metabolic um, biochemical response starts there might be overt damage to cells. It's been hard to see. We're starting with our newer imaging techniques, starting to see that some of the long fiber tracks in the brain are getting twisted and, and broken. Um, and that, sent, that starts this um, response, which we think is related to the symptoms people have. And it takes a while for that. The, so the brain wants to try to heal itself. It wants to try to um, protect itself. So it slows everything down at a time when it actually needs more um, glucose, which is what makes brains go, and um, it shuts it down. So there, there's sort of a, a, a mismatch that goes on in the brain. So you have the biological, the biochemical response, 
Plus, if there's any injury, it, it, it needs to try to repair the injury. Um, and so that, that takes a little time. Now, it turns out that the brain gets injured quite a bit. Um, you know, you fall down and on the ice and whack your head. You don't feel good. You have a headache for a couple of days. You might have a concussion. You get up, you go to work, um, and you do okay. Um, so the brain's job is to respond to whatever is going wrong and uh, adapt. So if there is some damage, the brain's going to try to work around the damage. It's, it's the, the great workaround machine. So everybody has some kind of problem in their brain, um, small glitches here and there, whether from um, toxic chemicals or nutrition or not enough sleep or, you know, lo lots of things can affect the brain. The key then is, well, how does it, how does it adapt and, and recover? And this is where the repetitive concussion piece comes in. It gets to a point where it starts to get hard for the brain to adapt and find a workaround. And so then you get sort of overt problems that, that people report. So that's what we think. We're not exactly sure, and the hunt is on to, to find that biological marker, whether it's a, a, a residual protein from what's going on in the brain that we can get through either saliva or blood and say, yes, there's a, a concussion, or whether it's a, a brain scan. Um, we don't know. We're still looking at it. In five years, we'll have it. I'm, I'm quite confident, but right now, we're still searching. So what's the most promising thing that you've found from your research? Well, it's not really from the research. It's from just common sense, and that is when we spec suspect somebody of having um, a concussion, bring, pull them out. You know, the, the, uh, the saying is, when in doubt, sit them out. That is the single most important thing we've done because we never used to do that. And, and that's, that, that's been very important. On the, on the real research side, we're getting close to um, a marker, um, and we're getting close to some understanding of, through imaging of exactly what's going on. So that once we really nail that down, we'll be able to you know, know when somebody has a concussion and when it's healed, and we'll be able to develop easier tools so we don't have to take blood all the time or put them in a scanner, but things that we have a lot of confidence in because we've compared them to those things so that we might have a, um, a finger stick on the sideline. Hmm. Uh, I mean, that, that's not too outrageous a thought. It used to be, but it, uh, it's not. Or um, there are people working on all kinds of things from uh, saliva to actual exhaling, uh, like a breathalyzer, um, to different kinds of tests. Um, so. There, there's so many exciting from a research point of view from the real nerd science point of view there's just tons of exciting stuff that's going on um, in in all kinds of areas um, vision audition balance uh, neuropsychological testing um, these um, urine analysis and protein analysis different kinds of scans so that's been one of the great things, is this has given us an opportunity to develop new techniques and new tools um, that, again, we can use for more serious brain injury, too. Because, again, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that that's really what this is about. This isn't about high-paid professional athletes, although it's good that we can help them. But we really want to understand brain injury. Right. Uh, what's the most frightening thing you've found or haven't found? Um, really bad clinical practice. I mean, just this year, I uh, saw a patient, um, a, a, a kid whose school said they didn't believe in concussion and they kept him playing and uh, wow. um, there could easily be a lawsuit um, uh, at some point about it. Um, some people just don't get it. Um, and then um, there's this whole area where it's become it's a money thing for, for some clinicians, so they create a bigger problem just to keep the patients coming back in. There's a term for it, it's called iatrogenesis, where the, uh, the, the healer actually makes it worse by paying too much attention to it. 
and so people take a long time to recover um, when they're really okay. Um, and, and that's, from a clinical, ethical perspective, that's, that's really troubling. Anything else you'd like to ask, add, doctor? Um, just that, I, you know, the hysteria of the media, um, and it, it, this isn't the media's fault, but um, it is, that's another troubling area, that, um, the, the CTE, the cr- traumatic, um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy with the brains of the NFL players. Those researchers are doing some good studies, but it gets distorted so that everybody's afraid that once you have a concussion, you're going to have degenerative disease. Um, there's a lack of um, kind of being patient with science because it takes a long time and jumping to conclusions and you know pulling kids out of out of football. Now, I I would never criticize a parent ever for doing that, but it does start to become a fever pitch sort of thing, and um, I think people have to have to use common sense and and be patient and um, you know, look to the experts in their area for for what the for what's really going on. And if you kind of covered that. If there was, say, an expert maybe in someone's local city or town, and they weren't really quite sure if it was the correct answer, it's best to get second, third opinions. Sure, sure. Um, and there's a, uh, the the web is um, a double-edged sword. There, there's some great information and there's some really bad information, um, but there is good information. So, um, uh, you know, I, I run into patients all the time who know quite a bit, and um, they they need to, to ask questions. And the other thing I tell parents is pay attention, pay attention to your kid. If they're acting different, then something's probably not right. Um, uh, so, that's. That's really key. Well, I appreciate your time, Doctor. Thank you so much for giving us a little bit of insight and uh, some more things that we can look out for. Okay. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hey, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the interview, please subscribe. Leave some feedback in the comments below. And if there's a topic you want me to cover or somebody that you'd like me to interview, just contact me and we'll see what we can do. Thanks.